Uh, good morning. My talk's going to be on uh, treating uh, complications of GI surgery uh, with endoscopy. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. I'd like to uh, point out in particular that uh, I'll be talking about stents, and, and I use uh, stents from Boston Scientific and Alveolus, and they have both, con both contributed to my uh, research funding. Uh, the way I'll set this talk up is we'll uh, make a, just a few uh, introductory comments to set the background. Uh, I'll talk about covered stents, which has really been the, the, the big uh, change in the last five years in how we treat surgical complications. Uh, we'll look primarily at upper GI complications, uh, leaks, bleeding, strictures, fistula, and then we'll, uh, the, the colon hasn't been looked at as much, but we'll, we'll see what has been done in that area as well. Uh, as, as this audience knows, GI surgery produces uh, staples or sutures, uh, lines which, which may have complications. Uh, there's been uh, endoscopic treatment described for acute leaks, for bleeding, for strictures, and for enterocutaneous fistula. Uh, the rationale of uh, doing this rather than our uh, old-fashioned approaches is that you can reduce the uh, need for parenteral nutrition, especially in the leak patients. Uh, it's shown you can decrease length of hospitalization and you can avoid uh, the high-risk revisional GI surgery that is sometimes necessary without uh, stents and clips. Uh, the, the big technologic innovation that, that's changed the, the landscape here is the development of covered stents. These are uh, mesh cannula that are made of either metal or plastic. They are compressed and they expand to a certain diameter and, and length. And uh, they're covered, meaning they have an outer coat of silicone, which makes them uh, impermeable to fluid so you can plug leaks, but also it keeps the mucosa from ingrowing and they can be removed. Uh, the delivery systems are, are small, uh, so you can get through strictures and, and around bends in the GI tract safely. Uh, there's different diameters, so you can choose uh, what stent to use for your uh, particular situation. Uh, they usually have a proximal flare on them to help hold them in place. Migration is one of the major problems with stents, and they are removable. Uh, this is an example of a stent, if you haven't worked uh, through these, with these. Uh, it has uh, an inner uh, metal uh, mesh core that's made out of nitinol. It's completely covered with plastic. It's got a, a flare, and then you see a suture at the end here for removal. You, you grab this. And when, uh, when you pull on that, it collapses the top and allows you to uh, remove it safely. Uh, the way we, we place these is uh, we first do uh, endoscopy. Once we've uh, identified that there's a complication, we mark the site of the pathology and the uh, squamal columnar junction with, uh, usually with an external paper clip, you can inject, inject contrast into the mucosa. Uh, we then place a guide wire into the rule limb. Uh, I do this under fluoroscopy. I think you get more uh, precision with that, although you can do it completely under endoscopic uh, visualization. Uh, you, you try to get your uh, stent at least uh, three to four centimeters below the pathology. And we oftentimes place a uh, inner second or third stent uh, so we get better capture of the uh, intestinal wall and, and decrease our migration rate. Uh, and then after we're done with the placement under fluoroscopy, we always do endoscopy uh, to make sure the stent is uh, positioned as we would like it to be. So this is an uh, example over the next few uh, series here of, of, uh, of an actual patient. Uh, here's someone that's had a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass gastrojejunal anastomosis here. Here's a small contained uh, leak that we chose to treat with, uh, with a stent. So to do this, uh, first we, uh, we put down the delivery uh, system, or put down the endoscope, and, and uh, put a wire deep within the, uh, 
the rule limb. Then we mark our sites of pathology. This would mark the squamocolumnar junction. This would mark the, the site of the leak. Uh, and then this would mark uh, uh, any area in the distal limb that I want to get across where there's an angle or, or, or an acute turn or something of that nature. We then put in the delivery uh, device and uh, And I think the next one will show it, or, or this is what the, the functional end of the handle looks like. Uh, you, you deploy the stent in two motions. First you grab this lever and, and pull it up and that will bring it halfway out. And then you can retrieve the stent at that time uh, if you want to reposition it. And then you complete the deployment by, by pulling on the, um, the blue lever. And then this is, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but this is the bottom of the uh, stent here below the pathology. And then it extends uh, well up into the esophagus. And the next day, or this is the uh, intraluminal uh, view of this stent to make sure uh, the placement is how we want it. And the next day we usually get a contrast study. Uh, this shows that the stent is across the, uh, the leak. It's going, the contrast goes down into the rule limb and it's, uh, up here uh, well into the esophagus to, uh, to capture the esophageal wall. And this is what our stent configuration looks like generally when we're finished. Uh, we'll have one stent that's extending well below the site of the leak. Uh, the proximal part of this goes up near the GE junction, sometimes above. We usually put a second stent within the first stent. Uh, we found that that uh, decreases our, uh, our migration rate. Uh, the stents that we are, have, that are, that I'm comfortable with and have used, is first of all the Alamax uh, stent, that's the one I uh, showed you on the picture, it has a nitinol metal base and a silicone cover, comes in a variety of sizes, in the GI tract we, I just used the, the 18 or the 22. Uh, Boston Scientific uh, has a, a wall flex covered stent, also made out of nitinol with a silicone cover. Uh, its diameters are 18 and 23 millimeters. Uh, there's a Boston Scientific partially covered, that is it leaves the proximal two centimeters of the stent uncovered. The idea is the mucosa can incorporate into this and it'll decrease migration. However, I have a lot of problems removing these stents, so I have currently stopped using them in my practice. Uh, early on we used uh, polyflex stents from Boston Scientific, but we had a very high migration rate with those, so I no longer use those as well. Uh, the day after the uh, stent is placed, we get a contrast study. Uh, we let the patients eat. If there's no evidence of leak on the contrast study, they often go home a day or two after the stent is placed. And then uh, we get a baseline x-ray and then weekly x-rays because of the high rate of migration. And if they migrate, we try to reposition them uh, or uh, put in uh, a, a different stent or a different technique uh, to keep it from migrating the next time around. Generally, uh, for leaks, we leave these in for four weeks. Uh, our experience, uh, we've had 17 patients. Uh, with leaks over a, a three year period. Eventually we were able to get 16 of 17 of those healed up just using stent therapy. Two developed a stricture that required another stent down the road and there was one leak that uh, persisted and required revisional surgery. This was early in our study and this patient had a significant con amount of contamination that we chose not to clear up and that's probably why it didn't heal. As far as uh, intraluminal bleeding, I think uh, endoscopy is a, a, a great way to avoid uh, a second surgery. Uh, usually this uh, is self-limited, it stops as you would know, but uh, sometimes these patients uh, don't stop bleeding, they need transfusions or get unstable. Uh, if you look at them, the, the bleeding site uh, at the gastrojejunostomy or where your anastomosis is, is usually uh, isolated and treatment is usually successful and it's usually safe. I think endoscopic clips are our best. Uh, I think they have the least risk of ischemia. Uh, there's also been success with epinephrine injections or electrical coagulation. 
without increased risk, but I, I, I think theoretically the clips are better. As far as GI strictures, just quickly, we had uh, eight patients uh, that developed strictures, two after leak. These patients have significant pain when you place the uh, stents in, so you have to be uh, ready for that. Uh, our stents were left in a median of eight days because of the problems with the pain. Uh, none of these patients have been reoperated on, but uh, there is one that's still not eating adequately and will probably need revisional surgery. As far as enterocutaneous fistula, we've treated four of these patients with uh, stents. Uh, three of these healed while allowing or oral nutrition, really made for a simple uh, treatment of the complication. Uh, one could tolerate oral nutrition, but every time we took the stent out, the, the fistula was still there. So we eventually went to a revisional surgery on that patient. Uh, the total experience at the University of Missouri is shown here. We've, we've treated 26 different patients with stent therapy. Uh, oftentimes you have to do multiple procedures on them. We've done 55 different stent placements and now have a 15-month medium follow-up. Uh, in 81%, we were able to give feedings immediately. Uh, we had resolution of the pathology in 22 of 26. And our unsuccessful ones, uh, two of them required revisional surgery, and uh, the two strictures uh, that required later uh, dilation were included as well. Uh, the complications, uh, the main, main thing that's, that's been a problem is stent migration. We've had a 40% uh, rate of stent migration. Of these stents that have migrated, usually they stop somewhere in the rule limb, and you can retrieve them endoscopically. Uh, we had three that passed through the GI tract completely, and then we had two of them that uh, got uh, hung up in the distal ilium and required laparoscopic removal. We've had to do uh, laparoscopic procedures due to the stent in four patients. Uh, we had the two that uh, migrated, and one patient uh, got an embedded stent. I could not get it out uh, endoscopically, so we had to do it laparoscopically. And one patient uh, developed a rule limb perforation at the distal end of the stent. Uh, you often get an ulcer there, but uh, in one patient we had a, an actual perforation that had to be repaired. As far as the migration, we found with experience that uh, you need to use longer stents of greater diameter, uh, multiple stents, and uh, we've had less uh, migration with the alveolar stents. Uh, they're a little more rigid and they have some anti-migration struts uh, that seem to decrease the migration. But it continues to be the main uh, complication. It's a, it's a nuisance generally, but occasionally it can cause a real uh, serious complication. So in, in our experience on balance, we think that uh, this is a, a marked uh, breakthrough. Uh, they greatly reduce morbidity and decrease use of TPN, ICU stay, hospital stay, and we haven't had a mortality. Moving on to the colon, which is much less studied, uh, there's one French report looking at uh, rectal perforations uh, of an, uh, an, an, or an anastomotic leak treated with covered stents. Uh, they were uh, successful in treating uh, these five patients. It seems to me it's, it's a reasonable uh, risk benefit if you have a small leak. Uh, sometimes patients refuse to have a stoma and this can bail you out of that situation and probably need uh, minimal systemic symptoms and minimal contamination. Uh, as far as colonic bleeding, it's been shown that colonoscopy is safe after colonic surgery. Uh, Post-op bleeding needing to be addressed, uh, you can use the colonoscope localize the bleeding, and again, use clips, and it might avoid uh, surgery that, that will be much uh, riskier. As far as uh, colonic strictures, uh, very little is known on this. We've done this in a couple of patients. We then checked out the literature. There's been 63 uh, reports of stents used for colonic strictures. Most were uh, in the older days before the covered stents. Uh, the results are, are not good. Uh, a lot of them migrated. Uh, there was a, a pretty good uh, level of patency, but there were lots of severe uh, complications with the metal stents, uh, erosions, uh, and those sort of things. Uh, the covered stents did not have the severe complications, but had a high migration rate. 
So we need better stents. And finally, clonic fistula. There's just been one small series uh, that shows it might be useful. Uh, not ready for routine, uh, routine use, and, and we need better uh, stent techniques. So the take home message is we've got some new tools here to use endoscopically for complications of GI surgery. Covered stents for upper GI leaks, uh, endoscopic clips for upper GI bleeding and clonic bleeding, and stents for stricture and uh, fistula. And I thank you for your attention.